Since the crisis erupted four years ago, the bank has demonstrated its nimbleness in the conduct of monetary policy. We reacted very quickly and forcefully during the downturn. And as the Canadian recovery progressed, we've emphasized that we'd be prudent with respect to the possible withdrawal of any degree of monetary stimulus. The bank always takes a flexible approach. Our decisions are guided by considered analysis and informed judgment rather than mechanical rules. For example, given the current material external headwinds that our economy faces, our policy rate can return to its long-run level after inflation is projected to reach 2 percent and our output is projected to reach its potential. The bank also exercises considerable flexibility with respect to the time horizon over which inflation should be expected to return to target. In general, both the size and nature of the shocks that hit our economy can have a bearing on the appropriate targeting horizon. Now, just as we do not have mechanical rules for the path of policy rates, we do not outsource our monetary policy to the U.S. Federal Reserve. What happens in the U.S. obviously matters for Canada, but that does not mean that our rates are tied to those of the Americans. Over the two decades of inflation targeting, the overnight rate in Canada has been more than 200 basis points above and, at times, more than 200 basis points below the federal funds rate. These variations reflect differences in our respective economic outlooks. Canadian monetary policy will be appropriate to Canadian circumstances and consistent with achieving price stability in Canada. Canadians can also be assured that the bank will take the necessary steps to ensure that core financial markets remain liquid and operating in the, in the event of a major finan or systemic shock the bank has a wide range of tools to provide exceptional liquidity consistent with a principle-based framework. This will help ensure that all Canadians benefit from the strength of our financial system in bad times as well as in good. Today the charts reveal three major currents. Canadian firms are underexposed to the fast-growing parts of the global economy. Commodity prices can expect it to remain elevated relative to their historic averages. And thirdly, our firms are not as productive as they could or need to be. Regardless of what happens in the U.S. or in Europe, these challenges and these opportunities need to be seized through sustained efforts here in Canada. The world's economic center of gravity is shifting rapidly away from advanced to, towards emerging economies. The game in the United States will be more about taking market share than participating in a growing market. To put it bluntly, the U.S. economy can be expected to be relatively weak for some time as households there repair balance sheets and governments wrestle with deficits. How weak depends on the choices Americans make, but given the pressures, there is limited upside. Canada will have to look elsewhere to grow our exports. Emerging markets already account for almost one half of the growth in trade over the past decade. In a process that can be expected to continue for decades, emerging Asia is rapidly urbanizing. China and India are housing the equivalent of, their entire, of the entire population of Canada every year and a half. In parallel, a massive new middle class is being formed, growing by 70 million people per year. Thus, even though commodity prices have eased somewhat in recent weeks, they can be expected to remain elevated, supported by large sustained demand increases from the emerging world, particularly Asia. We will need to take advantage of such opportunities because the limits of domestic debt here in Canada and our demography mean that the potential growth of our economy is slowing. As the boomer generation ages, labor force participation rates will decline and hours work will fall. The direction is clear. The question is merely one of degree. If we do not develop new markets and if we do not improve our productivity, the cumulative loss of income from slower potential growth here in Canada could be almost $30,000 for every Canadian over the next decade. So to conclude, it's often said uh, that Canada is not an island. This is true. It's a, good, it's a good analogy, and it illustrates well that we're not immune to global events. But perhaps uh, here today on the shores of the Bay of Fundy, a better analogy is that Canada is like a ship. We can be tossed by the waves or pulled by the current, but we are still able to chart our course in even the stormiest of seas. The challenges in the current global economic environment are significant, but so too are the opportunities. Our corporations and governments have strong balance sheets, our financial institutions are amongst the most resilient in the world, and our economy can be geared to the future sources of global growth. 
But to take advantage of these attributes, we will need continued heavy investment to improve productivity and sustained innovative, innovative efforts to develop new markets. For its part, the Bank of Canada will use its wide range of tools and policy options as appropriate in order to ensure that Canadians can seize these opportunities in an environment of domestic, macroeconomic and financial stability. As I said at the outset, at least in Ottawa, fall may be just around the corner. But we all know that Canadians are at their best during winter. Thank you. Thank you.